Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about designing social computing systems that support collective action by centering trust and familiarity. And I'll talk about how these systems help people build strong networks as well as provide support to move efforts forward when they stall. And I'm going to be presenting this work um, that I did together with accessibility advocates on Mozilla as well as worker rights advocates on Amazon Mechanical Turk. But I'd like to start with a vignette from an effort that's going on and I've been involved in as a participant observer and it has to do with harassment on Twitter. This includes things like death and rape threats that are unfortunately very common but are frequently used in a concerted way to silence people. And this is an issue that many people have very strong feelings about and they, ha and they are determined to act on and they have taken some action. So for instance, there's a change.org petition asking Twitter to shut down accounts that um, tweet threats and it has almost 400,000 signatures. And the actress Rose McGowan actually spoke out about against Harvey Weinstein's sexual harassment for the first time on Twitter and her account was suspended. Um, this caused a lot of outrage because people were um, upset that um, hate speech on the platform even when reported a lot of the time goes unchecked and then when someone's actually speaking out against harassment, they're the one who got shut down. So a couple people tried to organize a boycott in response. They chose a hashtag, um, women boycott Twitter. They uh, chose a date and they broadcasted the event through a, quite a number of high profile celebrities. But the effort itself was controversial. Some people boycotted the boycott. Um, other people made counter hashtags, such as women of color affirmation. Twitter promised to make changes, but they also said they have limited resources and the whole effort sort of fizzled. Why? I'm gonna argue that there were two main reasons for this. Um, the first is a lack of trust in the action. So especially among women of color or trans women who felt like they were all of a sudden so expected to participate in a boycott where they hadn't received similar support when they talked about their issues. One person said, if this is the event that um, activated your awareness, I don't particularly trust you. And the other reason that it stalled was that um, because there was friction among people who were potential supporters of the effort about, for instance, whether a boycott was an appropriate way to protest the silencing of women. I'll come back to this specific issue on Twitter at the end of my talk, but what I wanted to demonstrate here more generally was that even highly motivated collectives, when facing these kinds of open-ended, complex challenges, often fail to envision shared outcomes and act on them together. And to unpack this a bit, these groups of people with shared issues are very similar to the Dewey Information of Publics um, that is used by De Salvo and De Dante, and it's, uh, it's rooted in theories of democracy, talking about groups rallying around shared issues that affect them. What differentiates these particular groups that we're talking about here is that they're also acting together. So they're doing the work of coordination and collaboration, um, deciding or, and arguing between alternative um, paths to take, and they're also facing failure. And this is because of the nature of the challenges that they face. Um, these are challenges that are messy, interdependent, and they sound a lot like uh, wicked problems. Wicked Problems is a phase that originally came out of urban planning, but it's also frequently used in design thinking to talk about these kinds of problems that are difficult or even impossible to solve because there are just too many moving parts. And the problem itself changes as you try to solve it. So it makes the goal and the path to get to it unclear. So what I'm proposing in this talk is designing to support publics working together on these kinds of wicked problems. And we know from prior literature that the basis for a group to be able to work on a wicked problem together is that they need to know each other and trust one another. Familiarity is a term that I'm going to use a lot in this talk. Um, and it's a term coming out of uh, social psychology and organizational behavior that describes how well two people know each other. For instance, it can be measured by how long have they been working together in the past. And this is really important for collective action because Familiar groups uh, start to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses. Um, they develop situated knowledge about who knows what, um, and that enables them to strategize and coordinate action. Familiarity can also lead to trust, which increases psychological safety. People, groups with high psychological safety are more comfortable taking risks together. 
And finally, these kinds of familiar groups uh, tend to share knowledge. Um, sharing knowledge leads to collective sense making and can lead to the development of a shared identity, which is also very important. So for these collectives that have shared issues, um, it's for them to be able to act together, they need familiarity and trust. But rather than build that, the existing infrastructure that we have um, is designed around these um, and it's designed around increasing these engagement metrics. So it's designed around atomic fast-paced interactions. And HCI literature has actually found that um, the thing that on social media actually increases tie strength is having conversations with each other. But on the other hand, if you think about what is rewarded right now on the current design of Twitter, it's these things that are instant likes, retweets, things that get a lot of attention or sensational. And so in doing so, the social environments that we've built actually incentivize flyby disagreements and things that are sensational and disincentivize actual difficult conversation. So my main goal in this talk is going to be designing alternative environments that scaffold and guide social interactions toward building networks that can help groups form publics around issues and work together on the wicked problems that they face. So how are we gonna do that? Um, I'm gonna show through two projects that I worked on here during my PhD. So the first step um, is to bring a group together and help them build networks of familiarity. So what we want to do is encourage people to talk to the same small group of people over, over time so that they get to know each other. But at the same time, we want to balance this with reaching out and having conversations with new people who bring diverse perspectives. So I want to do the work of building a network. And that's the goal of my first project, Hive, which I did um, in part with accessibility advocates on Mozilla. But even when you have that, even when you have those networks of familiarity, um, efforts can still get stuck. Um, for instance, when there are disagreements. And I've worked on designing structured human support that can move efforts forward when they stall. And I'll talk about that in the context of my project Dynamo, which was uh, a collaboration with worker rights advocates on Mechanical Turk. Through these two projects, um, what I want to do is convince you that if we pay particular attention to a collective's relationships of trust, we can actually design social computing systems that assist that collective in acting together. And just as a heads up, these two projects uh, have very different methodologies. So um, in the first part of the talk, when I talk about the project Hive, um, I'm going to define a model of human behavior and then um, I'm going to design algorithms and we actually built a real world system that produced new kinds of social arrangements. Um, and then uh, was, we actually studied those new arrangements through controlled experiments and a field deployment. In the second half of the talk, when I talk about Dynamo, we took a grounded theory approach um, and we developed these concepts out of ethnographic study and co-design with the people we were designing with. So first I'll talk about Hive. And here we're mostly talking about the early stages of collective action. You have a group of people, they have some kind of shared issue that they all care about. Um, and people are trying to do the work of deliberation, understanding and articulating what exactly the problem is and collectively imagining goals and paths forward to alternative futures. And what I'm going to present is this concept of network rotation, which is a computational model that organizes conversations between these people. So it balances how strong people's ties are to the people they're uh, talking to at each point with who they're talking to and how tightly knit the overall network is. So what we're, what we're trying to do with this concept of network rotation is trying to get people to share their ideas, but also be exposed to different kinds of perspectives, uh, all while keeping the psychological safety of the group of people who are talking to each other at each point high. I'll explain what this all means. Um, but first, I wanted to um, remind us of what the current social computing infrastructure that we have and how it works. Um, so usually what happens when a group of people have a shared problem is that each person comes um, and they say the first thing that comes to their mind. Um, so in the case of harassment on Twitter, you might have someone thinking that in response, we should all boycott Twitter for a day. Someone else might think that, well, we should actually all share our stories for a day. Um, and another person might think that the best path of action is actually to start recording abuse, um, create a list of harassers um, and record it. And these ideas are often very different. Um, they're also often not very good by themselves because they fail to incorporate other people's viewpoints, experiences, and constraints. 
And because of this drawback, HCI literature has actually looked into the different ways that we can encourage people to engage with each other and intermix their ideas. Um, usually the way these systems are designed is that we will have a big gallery or map of everyone's ideas. And then we'll go to the person who came up with the boycott idea, for instance, and show them the recording idea and say, um, intermix these two ideas. Often what happens is that the person who came up with the boycott idea will come back and say, no, my idea was better. And the reason for this, drawing on research and communication theory and organizational behavior, is that in the real world, um, just having exposure to other people's ideas doesn't actually influence us that much. And we're much more influenced by other people's viewpoints when we talk to them. The reason for this is that knowledge is situated, and it's actually developed in the context of our social relations. So instead of intermixing ideas, I propose to intermix people. In one study, researchers showed that um, when they had these real-world teams working on um, a creative task, um, they, they had these teams working separately on the task, and then they took a piece of paper from a team, uh, asked them to write their ideas down, and they showed it to another team. And that actually had no effect um, on the outcome. They just ignored it. But when they did the same study and they moved a person from the first team to the second one, it actually significantly improved the team's output. So what we know is that engaging in these kinds of conversations with people can lead to better ideas that dig deeper into the problem. And this is the insight that this project Hive is based on. But what we want to do is make this possible at the scale of a big network. So I'm going to propose what I've termed network rotations. Instead of having everyone in the collective talk to everyone at the same, po at the same time, what it's going to do is divide people into teams. Um, so people are in these smaller groups where they actually get to have a conversation with each other and get to know one another. And then it's going to iteratively weave people together from distant parts of this network. What it's trying to do here is facilitate the spread of distant viewpoints within the collective. There are many, many different ways to do this, to reorganize this network in a way. And what we want to do is do this intelligently or effectively. So the first question we need to ask is, what are the conditions for an effective network rotation? We already talked about one of them at the beginning of the talk, familiarity, which increases psychological safety. And I've actually worked on research that used um, a dynamic programming algorithm to optimize for highly familiar teammates when we didn't know individual availability for each person. But the challenge with that is that we don't want to always talk to the same people over and over. We want people to engage with these kinds of diverse perspectives from people who have maybe thought about the problem differently than we have. So I'm going to hypothesize that balancing these two needs will actually be more effective than strategizing to maximize either. And I'm going to show you how the network rotation algorithm actually does that. It balances familiarity, which we measure in the network as the tie strength between every two per people, and the structure of the network, which we measure as network efficiency. And I'm going to show you through two deployments that we did, that by using network rotation, teams submitted better proposals. Um, it didn't reduce psychological safety, and it was actually used by Mozilla's accessibility advocates for a week-long design drive. So first I'll talk about um, Hive's network rotation um, and then the results of our control experiment and field deployment. So again, the core technical contribution of this work is the concept of network rotation. What it does is manage membership of teams by iteratively weaving people from distant parts of the network. I'll walk you through first what that would actually look like in practice. So when you first join a project um, on Hive, the algorithm will add you to a small team of three to five people. Um, it was really important for us in deploying this system to make it uh, usable by, in the real world for people. So we decided to use existing tools that people were already familiar with. So we developed Hive as a Slack app, um, which is a chat software and also gives people the option of being anonymous. So based on the team that you were assigned to by Hive, you will get added to a Slack channel for that team and you'll start working with those people. And then at some point, um, Hive decides that it wants to expose your group to a distant perspective. So it might swap out one of your teammates for someone new who was on another team. The way it does this in practice is that there's a Slack bot. It'll come to your uh, team and announce that we're moving this person out and this other person may be moving in. And then it actually performs the move. 
So now you have a new team and you continue working with this new team. Um, and by the end of the day, the algorithm might decide to make another set of moves. And as you're probably seeing by now, there are many, many different ways to do these rotations. And it gets way, way more complicated when you have more than just four teams. So to do this, the network rotation algorithm needs to decide when to make rotations, who to move, and where to move them to. And there is an exponentially large number of possible solutions. So to do this, we modeled the whole collective as a weighted graph. Tie strength in that graph is a familiarity between every two people who are on the same team together at that point. So if this is the network, these are the teams, what we really care about is the tie strength between people who are on the same team together. The other thing we care about is um, the general network structure. So um, this is modeled as network efficiency. This relates to how closely knit the network is. Our hypothesis is that if we are going to make this disruption, move a new person onto a team, um, it's better to do this effectively. And doing this from, with someone who's in a distant part of the network will probably be better than someone who's close by. Um, and this is based on literature and organizational behavior. People sometimes in organizations talk about this in the context of structural holes within a network. So for instance, if you have these two networks, they have the exact same number of edges, but their structure is different. The way we measure this is that if you take two nodes um, in the graph and you measure the shortest path between them, um, and then you average this over all of the pairs of nodes in the graph, you'll get a measure of network efficiency. So that's the average pairwise shortest path between every two people. So given these two metrics that we know we care about, we want an algorithm that actually balances them. Um, we usually balance things with optimization functions. Uh, we can also turn this into a weighted sum so that that gives us some more power over which of these metrics we care more about. Um, so to explain what this means, um, if we set alpha to one in this, uh, in this optimization function, what that means is that I only care about tie strength. I don't care about what the network looks like. And that will give us an algorithm that won't move anyone anywhere and it'll always, you'll always stay with the same people. If we set alpha to zero, that means that all I care about is network structure. I don't care about how strongly tied the people who are on the same team are. So that will mean that the algorithm will constantly be moving people around. You'll get a, very, a network with a lot of edges, but all of those edges will be pretty weak. What we actually want is to balance these two, so find a middle ground where most of the time you're working with people you know pretty well, but then you also have these um, a small number of uh, disruptions over time. So now that we know what the objective is, how does the algorithm work? So the algorithm needs to decide at each point um, who it's going to move, if, if any, and where, they're, where we want to move them to. So um, assume that this is the network, uh, we choose, the algorithm chooses one person and wants to move them to another team. And it wants to know what's the value of this move, should I make this move or not? Well, you can actually make the move, see how much better the, the optimization function is after you made the move, and then see whether you want to do it or not. So what's the value of this move? Now that, but we don't want to have just one move, we want to have more. So um, we calculate the value of the first move. Now if we want to try a second move, um, we want to calculate the value of the second move, the value that we calculated first will no longer be valid because the network will look different. So we, we, we need to, um, because one of the assumptions that we made is no longer valid, we can't keep doing these same simple calculations over time. And that's what makes this problem difficult to solve. There is an exponential number of possible solutions, and as we're going, team composition keeps changing. So it's impossible to know what the value of a single move is. Um, I've proposed a stochastic search algorithm that tries to do this. So it chooses the best subset of move at, at moves at each point, and it calculates the value of that subset of moves. So at each point, instead of doing one move and seeing how much, it's, how much value it has, it takes a whole subset of moves and sees what the value of all of those moves together is. And then it loops um, over time, trying lots, as many subsets of moves as it possibly can, um, and it has random resets so that it doesn't get stuck in local maxima. So that's how the algorithm works. Um, Hive the system, as I mentioned, is a Slack app. It manages team membership. Um, Hive can also provide structure to a conversation because um, it's a Slack app. Um, so in, in our deployments, we actually followed one iteration of the design process to help pe guide people in what to talk about each day that they were in this project and what the goal of each phase is. So there was a one day for um, 
empathizing one day for defining the problem and they went through this process and they were given instructions for what to talk about as well as sometimes deliverables to help guide them. So our goal with Hive was to organize conversations that lead to more effective collective action. And the first thing we wanted to do is um, control for as much as we could and see whether this was actually effective. So we wanted to isolate the effect of network rotation. We recruited 115 Amazon Mechanical Turk workers to do this. Um, we gave them a prompt that was, how can we design um, neighborhood commons to be a place uh, to bring people together to foster community and mutual aid? And we tried to choose a prompt that a lot of people had experience with already, and we actually took a rubric from OpenIDEO to, to measure the proposals at the end. And we randomly assigned these people to one of uh, three conditions. So the first condition, the control condition, was when we had no moves at all. So that's the same as when I showed you that graph when alpha was one, uh, we were maximizing tie strength. Um, in the other condition, we maximized network efficiency, not constrained by tie strings. So that's when we were doing lots of moves and trying to make a very efficient network. Um, and finally, network rotation was our algorithm. So we compared these three scenarios. To do this, teams went through five phases of the design process in two days. Um, and to measure how well they did at the end, we hired a design expert to actually rate the proposals based on a rubric that we gave them. What we found was that network rotation actually improved over the baseline, the control condition, but network efficiency didn't. This suggests that we want moves that factor in the structure of the network. We don't want to just be doing moves. Um, but one thing that we still worried about, even though these uh, network, network rotation was actually resulting in better proposals, was that maybe it made people feel less comfortable contributing because um, we are causing some disruption by moving a teammate off of your team or adding someone new into the team. So we looked at a measure that's often used for this, um, psychological safety. And we wanted to see whether psychological safety actually decreased. So psychological safety is a measure uh, frequently used in organizational behavior, um, and it's about measuring the ability of teams to take risks. It's a strong correlate with team performance, and it's been validated uh, in a number of different scenarios. It's a standard survey that has questions like, um, members of this team are able to bring up problems and tough issues, or working with members of this team, my unique skills and talents are valued and utilized. So when we give people the survey psychological safety, it gives us back a score um, out of zero, uh, from zero to 50. Um, and what we wanted to measure is whether psychological safety of these teams suffered when they went through network rotation. So the first thing we looked at is the survey responses between people who were on static teams versus teams who um, had, had a member join or leave. And what we found was that psychological safety didn't really suffer from the moves. Um, there's one group who's actually not in, this, um, not in this graph right now, and those are the actual people who were moving. So if you were taken off of the team you were on and added to a new team. And for those people, we saw that psychological safety did actually go slightly down. Um, the reason for this is that as people became attached to their ideas and the people they were working with, um, it was more difficult for them to reintegrate into a team later on in the process. And what this shows is that, uh, that network rotation is actually costly. Um, and it's important that when we do do it, we do it effectively. So um, we showed that network rotation is effective. Um, but another thing we wanted to know is, would people actually do this in the real world? So we partnered up with Mozilla's open innovation team. Um, they issued an open call to their communities of volunteers um, and accessibility enthusiasts, um, asking them to participate in a week-long online design drive. Um, the goal of this was to reimagine uh, what an accessible web browsing experience can look like. Um, we also reached out um, and offered uh, people with disabilities uh, or people who are caregivers to someone with a disability a $150 gift card to participate in the project because we wanted um, this design drive to be actually grounded in people's real world experiences. And these people were added as team leads, so each team had at least one of these people. This was a week-long online effort that actually took a lot of time. And we had very little attrition. So out of the, I think, 120 people who participated, uh, only six people dropped out by the end. Um, and on average, teams posted about 1,000 lines of chat a day. To give you a sense of the kinds of proposals that came up um, by the end, I'll show you two of them. So 
this first one is about um, ways of interacting with a computer that is similar to sign language. And actually, one of the members of this team um, knew sign language. And what they were saying is that within communities of people who sign, um, they're cons consistently reconfiguring gestures to mean new things. Um, and they wanted a way to be able to teach the computer what these new gestures mean or come up with, with ones that they wanted to use frequently. So for instance, um, the, a specific gesture that was the name of a friend could mean send an email to that friend, or uh, nodding your head could mean save the document. Another one was about reactive interfaces, so interfaces that uh, realize when you're having trouble with them and sort of react to make it easier to do the thing you're trying to do. So for instance, if, if they figured out that you tried to click on a button a couple times and weren't able to, maybe they could make that button larger um, to make it easier, especially for people who have motor problems. Um, all of these 86 proposals were reviewed by Mozilla's accessibility team, um, who was independent of our study, and they gave the groups feedback on their proposals. Um, they, were, they chose four that they were really interested in, and they're continuing to work um, on those proposals. So what I want to talk about now briefly is what we learned during this process. So when we did this in the real world, one of the things we learned is that uh, participants told us that new members brought fresh perspectives uh, and they allowed for more ideas to come into the room. One of the participants said, meeting new people was great, mixing ideas was very helpful, especially as people dropped in and out later in the week. And while fresh perspectives were exciting and helpful, um, people also showed concern about losing on to ties that they had already built with the old team. Um, one person said, I liked bringing fresh ideas in every day. It gave a different or uh, new perspectives. Um, but, I, but sometimes you build good working relationships with people and you don't want to lose them. And this result, again, demonstrates the importance of balancing tie strength with network efficiency. And one way to mitigate this might be to give teams more control over when they actually want to participate in, member, in membership rotation or not. And finally, we found that um, the anonymity that Hive afforded, um, in these, in, which, which, was not, which is not common in these kinds of design, uh, design drives, actually made people more comfortable um, to share their stories. Um, so it increased psychological safety by creating an environment where people actually trusted enough to share. Uh, one of our participants who had a disability said, Wow, that didn't even feel like an hour. I'm loving this. This is stuff I never talk about. It's helping me realize some things about myself that I was blind to before I started this, um, before I started talking about it here. Uh, thank you all. So with Hive, I just demonstrated that it's possible to create these kinds of environments that enable collectives to come together and build familiarity and generate plans and proposals. Hive was designed specifically for groups who had a shared issue but didn't know each other yet. Dynamo, in contrast, the second project that I'm going to talk about, um, was designed for and by people who did know each other. And familiarity was actually contributing to the problem. This um, is the kind of problem that we couldn't formulate like we did for Hive. We couldn't formulate and design an algorithm for. In fact, I'm going to argue through the second part of the talk that um, the kind of work that it required um, could not actually be written into code. And instead, we actually used um, structured human labor. So what I'm going to do is move from an algorithm heavy section of the talk and move into one that's rooted in qualitative work and participatory design. And to present Dynamo, I'm going to go back to the argument that I made at the very beginning of the talk, that many collective action efforts online never succeed, and why. We already went through one of the reasons why that might happen, which was a lack of familiarity and trust. But friction can still happen despite familiarity. The collective that we, we worked with um, in this scenario, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk Workers, also known as Turkers, um, consisted of multiple tightly knit communities. And they had uh, experienced disagreement and animosity in the past. They even had a name for it in their community of practice. They called it mega drama. So with Dynamo, what we wanted to see was how can we support collective efforts despite these problems that people had. So I engaged with Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. Um, in, in the communities that they had, a series of forums and chat rooms. Um, I did a year of ethnographic field work that deepened my understanding of the kind of work environment that they had and the challenges that they faced. But this also enabled me to build a working relationship with them. 
Then together we designed and deployed Dynamo. So I'm going to start um, talking about Dynamo by talking about the challenges of online work. So what, are the, what were the set of shared issues that these people had that brought them together? And then I'm going to talk about our effort to address it, Dynamo. I'll explain common failure scenarios that happened and the specific kinds of um, organizing and emotional labor that it took to move these efforts towards success. This is work that uh, we've termed the labor of action, um, and I'll explain its mechanisms in more detail. So researchers have argued that crowdsourcing platforms create these computational infrastructures that make the crowd workers actually seem invisible. So as a result, there's a whole labor market online that has emerged that leaves many workers struggling to find good work or to assert their rights when they're mistreated. And in response to that, um, Turkers have actually formed collectives um, using web forums and chat software. Um, and they use a lot of these communities to share good work or to talk to employers um, or even to raise money when someone needs it. What I found in, in my ethnography was that these forums were more effective at coordinating the kinds of efforts that people wanted to do when the effort itself was not controversial and when individual actions still had an effect. But they struggled more when the goal or how to get to it wasn't clear or when um, it was an effort that actually needed many hands to share their burden. What I found was that Turkers actually talked a lot about the issues that they faced, but they had trouble taking the next step. And this is essentially the same problem as Twitter users faced when um, they, ha they faced friction over strategy and tactics and it actually caused the whole effort to fizzle. So how can we support an online collective, not just to discuss, but to agree on a common goal and execute it? Now, our, our effort to uh, try to answer this question was Dynamo. So um, our process for designing Dynamo was interactive and iterative. Um, it involved almost 100 people. Um, and we began by engaging with Turkers on forums, publishing surveys on Mechanical Turk, having lots of conversations with people. And then at the beginning, uh, a, few, a, a few Turkers showed more interest. And um, slowly, as we progressed, it engaged more people. Dynamo itself is an online forum um, that supports the Amazon Mechanical Turk community to form collectives um, and around shared issues and mobilize. And to show you how it works, I'll again walk you through one scenario. This, this uh, it was an event that was actually triggered by a well-meaning researcher who injected false information into Turkopticon. Turkopticon is sort of like the Yelp uh, for Amazon Mechanical Turk where people can review, re review employers. Um, this caused a lot of frustration because um, a lot of the Turkers actually relied heavily on the information on Turkopticon for their jobs. Um, and actually, they spent a lot of tr time trying to figure out what had happened, where they thought that it was getting spammed. And by the end of it, Turkers agreed that researchers just lacked exposure to the kinds of issues and vulnerabilities they faced as Turkers. So this prompted them to want to write a set of um, publicly available ethical guidelines for research on Amazon Mechanical Turk and its communities. Um, they envisioned that these guidelines could both be a means to guide ethical behavior, but also to back Turker claims when things go wrong. But there's this big gap um, from wanting ethical guidelines to actually creating them and having everyone agree on them. And I'll quickly go over the socio-technical infrastructure that we created for this. Um, so Dynamo is based on short ideas, which are tweet length um, pitches. It can be a problem. It can be an idea that someone has. And then people can vote up or down on them. And then once an idea gets 25 upvotes and has more upvotes than downvotes, it evolves into a campaign. Uh, it officially launches on the front page of the website. And there is various infrastructure there to support it, such as wikis and buttons for signing things. So Dynamo supports um, collectives to form publics around issues and mobilize. Publics come together through the shared conditions that they have or the shared issues that they have. And together, they develop formulations and analyses of what the problem is. And much of the research on publics actually has focused on this, on what are the conditions for discourse and assembly. We build on, on this work um, that is heavily rooted in theories of participatory democracy, uh, but we also take up the conditions by which these um, publics can su successfully act together. And it gets tricky when shifting from deliberation to action. Dynamo efforts um, almost failed multiple times. 
they faced two common failure scenarios that we saw. And I'm going to argue that these two common failure scenarios, stalling and friction, are actually common pitfalls that any online action can fall into. And the reason for this, and particularly why we're talking about online action, is that I'm going to argue the same decentralized characteristics that make it very easy to gather online also make it very difficult to actually, um, also make it very easy to disperse, so difficult to stick together. So in other words, it's very easy for t someone to uh, walk into a room where people are having a discussion and throw a flame. Um, it's also very easy for people to back off and leave. Stalling, the first problem that um, came up a lot was when that, that exactly happened. So the effort lost momentum and it stopped. And this usually happened when the next steps uh, or how to get to it were either difficult to identify or too much work for a single person to do. And the whole effort lost momentum. Uh, one of the efforts on Dynamo uh, was a letter writing campaign that um, actually stalled. Um, after weeks of discussion about how to do this letter writing campaign, six Turkers had written and shared their letters, um, and the campaign organizer, um, who was a community manager on a Turker forum, contacted us and said, so it seems no one is interested. Um, someone uh, just says we're doing it wrong, but won't say how to do it right, and no one else has any input. But stalling was still in many ways better than uh, the alternative, friction. Um, friction happened when there was active criticism and negative emotion targeted at the effort's progress. For instance, uh, with the guidelines effort that I mentioned, uh, one Turker midway through expressed disappointment about there was a certain paragraph in the guidelines that was not exactly in compliance with Amazon's terms of service. So this was offering guidance about how to use um, a very specific kind of screen reading software that was uh, technically against the terms of service, but a lot of people used it anyway, especially for psychology studies. Um, this Turker critiqued this position that the guidelines had taken, but then also had um, general critiques because they felt like the guidelines had gotten mired in technical detail when it was supposed to be this high level document of ethics. So stalling and friction um, are the twin pitfalls that I'm going to argue are inherent challenges to any kind of community that acts. To avoid stalling, members need to act. Um, but acting can backfire if other, people's, if other people disagree with what you did, causing friction. To address friction, on the other hand, can reduce motivation in the people who are getting critiqued, um, and it, that causes stalling. So in other words, trying to fix one of these problems actually often causes the other. And so it seems that online collectives have far more reasons to fail at acting together than to succeed. When on Dynamo actions faced um, these pitfalls, we stepped in and we performed the labor that we, we thought was necessary to preserve the forward motion of the movement. Um, I'll call this the labor of action, and I'll explain how we did this. So as issues came up on the website, um, we worked to help people move past them. And gradually, as we were doing this over time, we found that there were common mechanisms that we kept using. So um, we drew out these mechanisms, we gave them a name, so that we can transfer them to other kinds of contexts. My main contribution in this work is this idea of the labor of action, which, um, which includes particular kinds of emotional and cognitive labor that I'm going to describe. And I'm going to argue that the mechanisms that we use can actually um, be also used to catalyze action in other kinds of online communities. Um, I'll describe two of these mechanisms. So the first was debates with deadlines. Um, when friction happened over that one paragraph in the deadline where some people wanted it, other people didn't, um, it, it turned into a heated debate that quickly derailed the whole discussion about the guidelines. And here our role was to suggest a deadline for that debate, um, which gave the members involved in the disagreement a reason to find common ground. Um, here's a concrete example of how we did this. So I stepped in in the forum and I said, We've spent so much time and energy on this. We need a last effort to reach consensus. We need your help for that to happen. Um, do you think that setting a deadline will help? Um, one of the people in that argument responded, I do agree that we should wrap things up soon, if possible, without unnecessary sacrifices. Another labor of action was act and undo. 
Um, this specifically helped when there was stalling. So for instance, when we approached the deadline to actually publish the guidelines, um, there was one section of the guidelines titled what to do in cases of violation um, that remained untouched. No one wanted to write anything there. And here we stepped in and we actually drafted three emails that um, were in the form of templates that Turkers could use to uh, contact researchers and IRBs in the cases of violation. And this quickly started a heated debate because some people were angry that our framing was too restricting. Um, one Turker who was actually a leader in the guideline effort um, posted, the purpose of Dynamo um, should be to add to the rights and recourses of Turkers, not to limit or replace them. But our action did get the effort moving. So after some discussion and editing, uh, people were happy with the end result. We call this uh, mechanism act and undo. Um, take action, but leave space for objections and undo your action if necessary. The point here wasn't for us to do something right the first try, but to do something, even if it was initially perceived as wrong. Because um, this kickstarts inertia. People are a lot better at pointing out why something is wrong than they are at putting out a proposal in the first place. So these are two of the mechanisms. Um, I'd be happy to talk about more in the Q&A. But um, the final question is, did these mechanisms actually help? Um, I'll talk about two of the efforts that succeeded on the platform. After about a month of work, um, uh, Turkers finally published the guidelines effort um, on September 7th, which was Labor Day. It's available online as a 23-page write-up, um, and it covers different matters that affect Turkers, like fair payment and respecting Turker privacy. It has 261 signatures so far from researchers and Turkers, and the Stanford IRB actually uses it to approve research. We've also seen researchers references, reference this in tasks on Mechanical Turk and on research papers. Another group uh, launched a collective effort to show the world who Turkers are written from their own perspective. Um, this was an open letter writing campaign that Turkers wrote directed to Jeff Bezos, Amazon CEO. Um, 30 people posted their letters publicly um, that you can read at this URL, and it was covered by major news outlets, including The Guardian and The Daily Beast. And since then, Turkers have actually gone action on two of the things that they had asked for in their letters. So to conclude, Dynamo was about how structured labor, the labor of action, can help these movements overcome the challenges of stalling and friction and to move forward. And what's central here is the fact that the labor of action is not something that we could have written into code. Um, it requires contextual knowledge and familiarity with the members of the public and their goals. Some of the actions that people are taking here are actually risky, so it requires identified trustworthy actors. And this, I think, challenges the idea that social software by itself um, can produce the conditions for social change. And I would instead encourage us to think about um, the ways that centering labor, the ways that we can center the labor that combined with software um, can actually create those conditions. So how can we better support that labor through software? And for the past few months, I've actually been advising coworker.org, which is a non-profit -pla non platform developer for worker collective action. Um, they're interested in creating um, and maintaining Dynamo as an anonymous moderated platform for worker advocacy in a range of um, other kinds of uh, workplaces. Some of the open questions here are, um, how do we actually support the workers who are doing and train them to do the labor of action um, combined with the software that they're developing? So in this talk, I argued that to support publics working on wicked problems collectively, uh, we need to design social computing systems that center trust and familiarity. And through Dynamo and Hive, I demonstrated that human labor and computational models are both important parts of socio-technical systems. And to wrap up, um, thinking about the Twitter example and other kinds of collective action problems, I just want to note that um, collective action is hard, complicated, and it has many different aspects. And I, I think that my projects provide a step in what I believe are the right direction in supporting that kind of work. Um, for instance, uh, thinking about um, familiar networks, Hive uh, provides some patterns for building those kinds of networks when people don't know each other yet. Um, and Dynamo provides patterns for us to learn about working with disagreements uh, to, and preserving momentum. But they have limitations. So Hive can help people who are willing to talk to each other, but if people aren't willing to talk, then there's not much to do. 
Um, disagreements can actually be very useful um, and um, they can help people see new viewpoints. Um, and Dynamo and the labor of action can help people move forward when those kinds of things happen. Um, but not if things have completely derailed. And there's still a lot more work to do in this area. Um, other aspects of collective action include making shared decisions, um, gathering and sharing information, creating a shared identity, um, supporting peripheral participation, um, and I plan to continue working on these different aspects in the future. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions.